Shit, if they'd got me for all the I did, I probably wouldn't be sitting in this damn car. We'd probably be doing this interview somewhere on death row. Uh, he was a big time uh, drug dealer. I'm not gonna put something on the big screen to glorify the gangster world, but they're gonna see the suffering, they're gonna see the pain, they're gonna see the hurt. They're gonna see what I saw. Pee Wee Kirkland might not be a household name, but in the realm of street ball, he's nothing short of a legend. He's hailed as one of the greatest basketball players to ever step foot on the gritty blacktop courts of New York City. I first heard about Pee Wee Kirkland when uh, he was an outstanding basketball player. But Pee Wee wasn't just a legend with the basketball in his hands. He was a legend in the streets, too. Harlem in the 1960s and 70s was a world unto itself, especially in the ghetto where options were limited. As Big famously said, either you're selling crack rock or you got a wicked jump shot. Pee Wee Kirkland mastered both games. He was a wizard with a basketball and ran the drug game like a kingpin. Back in Pee Wee's day, was the drug of choice, and it hits the streets like the Black Plague, tearing families apart one hit at a time. For young men growing up during that era, hustling wasn't just a way to make money, it was a way of life, a means to escape the crushing poverty that surrounded them. Over time, the hustle becomes an obsession, an addiction to the flashy cars and shiny clothes that symbolize success, and escape from the hardships of ghetto life. But here's a question. Why hasn't Hollywood jumped on Pee Wee's story like they did with other infamous drug lords? Well, the truth is, Hollywood did try. Several times, in fact. But Pee Wee turned them down every time. Why? Because Hollywood has a knack for glorifying gangsters while glossing over the deeper, more complex realities of their lives, and the political ideas that some of them had to try and change their communities. Pee Wee Kirkland was one of those people who wanted to make a difference. According to Pee Wee, there are several reasons why he's not interested in a tell-all story. First off, it would never be the complete truth. He doesn't want to drag other people's names through the mud, especially since many of them have moved on and built respectable lives for themselves as judges, lawyers, and other professionals. Bringing up their past would do more harm than good. A tell-all story and, and, you know, ruining people's lives. Well, judges and lawyers and some of me on the Supreme Court. You know, but if they didn't get caught, they went and moved on with their life. So I would never do even my life story. Another reason Pee Wee shunned Hollywood is something that happened back in the 90s when he was still in prison. They approached him with a questionnaire to help write a script about his life, but the very first question rubbed him the wrong way. It suggested that because his mother couldn't provide for him, he had no choice but to turn to crime. This question was a deal breaker for Pee Wee. He didn't even bother reading the second question. There was no way he was going to blame his mother for his choices. Everything he did was his decision, and he wasn't about to let anyone paint a different picture. Basically, you know, was working hard and didn't have a lot, so you probably did what you could. That was it. I never read the second question because it's no way in the world I'm gonna blame my mother. Lastly, Pee Wee Kirkland doesn't want his story to glorify the gangster lifestyle. Once you put it on the big screen, you lose control over how it's perceived. According to him, audiences would not only see a story, but also the pain and suffering that came with it. They'd see the world through his eyes, and that's not something he believes would do anyone any good. He doesn't want to contribute to a narrative that could inspire others to follow a similar path, thinking it's glamorous when in reality it's filled with hardship and regret. Because once you wake up, you know, when you know what it is, you know what it's not. I'm not going to put something on the big screen to glorify the gangster world. But they're going to see the suffering, they're going to see the pain, they're going to see the hurt. They're going to see what I saw. A lot of people are on the same page as Kirkland when it comes to Hollywood and its portrayal of black culture. It seems like every other gang movie or hip-hop narrative just reinforces certain stereotypes. Pee Wee Kirkland has been vocal about his issues with hip-hop, too, criticizing it for glorifying things that shouldn't be glorified. He's worried about the younger generations getting sucked into a lifestyle of smoking, doing drugs, and all the other negative influences promoted by certain music. Look at this hip-hop hit hard. Ever since it hit, we, it's almost worse than crack. We got more young people smoking. Ice Cube has echoed these sentiments. He made some eye-opening comments in an interview with Bill Maher. Ice Cube pointed out how people at the top can manipulate the culture using hip-hop as an example. He explained that the same people who own major hip-hop labels also own private prisons. It's a twisted setup where the music that comes out seems designed to push people towards a life that ends in prison. The records that come out are really geared to push 
people towards that prison industry. When Bill Maher argued that no one forces the artist to write those lyrics, Ice Cube countered that it's about how the industry sets guardrails to ensure certain types of songs get promoted while others don't. He revealed that some records are practically crafted by committee, with record company execs dictating what artists should write about. Being there as guardrails to make sure certain songs make it through and certain songs don't. Certain flavors are exposed on the record. This lines up with an anonymous letter that's been making the rounds, titled The Secret Meeting That Changed Rap Music and Destroyed a Generation. The letter, which was published on the Hip Hop is Red website, spills some serious tea about the early 90s. According to the author, they are what you'd call a decision maker in a big music company, and the industry was way different back then. Without today's technology and media accessibility, the industry had a tight grip on the public and could influence them however it wanted. This might explain why the author was invited to a super secret meeting in early 1991 with a small group of music industry insiders to talk about the future of rap music. Little did they know they were about to be roped into something pretty shady. The meeting took place at a private house on the outskirts of Los Angeles with about 25 to 30 people in attendance. Most of them were familiar faces from the industry, but there were also a few strangers who kept to themselves. The author and their colleagues were joking around about the meeting's theme, because many of them didn't care much for rap music and didn't see why it warranted such a private gathering. Things took a weird turn when they were asked to sign a confidentiality agreement before the meeting could start. This one-page document was very clear. Violating its terms would mean getting fired. Some people were so spooked they left right then and there. The author thought about leaving too, but stayed out of curiosity. Then the conversation took a sharp turn. The speaker revealed that their companies had invested in privately owned prisons, a highly profitable industry. The idea was that their influence in the music industry could help keep these prisons filled, thus making more money. Most people in the room were confused, especially since private prisons weren't widely known at the time. Someone asked what private prisons had to do with them, and the speaker explained that these prisons made money based on the number of inmates funded by the government. The more inmates, the more money the prisons got. And since these prisons were privately owned and could become publicly traded, they could buy shares and profit personally. Now, shifting gears back to movies and the point Kirkland made about Hollywood glorifying gang life, besides the glamorization, there were serious downsides to making these types of films. Back in the 90s, whenever one of these gang movies hit theaters, every street gang and gangster wanted to see it. With only a few cinemas around, everyone ended up in the same spot. This often led to some of the most nights in American history as gang rivalries erupted right outside the theaters. Take New Jack City for example. Directed by Mario Van Peebles, it's about the rise and fall of a ruthless Harlem drug lord Nino Brown played by Wesley Snipes. The movie also stars Ice-T who often faced criticism for his music being too Ice-T plays one of the undercover detectives trying to take down Nino's drug empire. Nino Brown's character was inspired by real-life figures, specifically the Notorious Chamber Brothers from Detroit. A lot of people referenced me as the guy that inspired the movie New Jack City. And you know, a lot of people uh, jokingly call me Nino Brown. The Chamber Brothers were not your run-of-the-mill gangsters. They were cunning, ruthless, and climbed to the top of Detroit's underworld, leaving chaos and destruction in their wake. Years, uh, well, I didn't actually serve 27. I served 23 years on the 27-year sentence. Now, when New Jack City hit the theaters, it was absolute chaos. New Jack City f***ed up their opening because someone got shot in a movie theater <laughs> that weekend. They're like, no black films in theaters. No, sorry. Okay, all blacks, stay home. Shop owners were left sweeping up broken glass, and community leaders were scrambling for answers after hundreds of young people went on a rampage in Westwood Village. They looted stores, threw beer cans, vandalized cars, and even tore branches off trees to smash store windows. The chaos started when hundreds of ticket buyers at the Man Westwood Fourplex Theater on Gailey Avenue were turned away from the just-released movie New Jack City. The theater officials insisted they hadn't oversold the movie, but eyewitnesses said the was partly fueled by the tension surrounding the highly publicized beating of Rodney King by Los Angeles police officers. As the streets filled with angry youth, some shouted slogans like Black Power and Fight the Power, making pointed references to the Rodney King incident. Outraged shop owners said they had warned the police about potential linked to the movie's opening. However, the police seemed hesitant to stop the looters, likely due to the public outcry over Rodney King's controversial beating. The looters hit 17 stores in the trendy shopping village, making off with everything from leather jackets and bicycles to compact discs and athletic gear. Shoe boxes and clothes hangers from other stores were scattered across the street. The police couldn't provide a damage estimate, but it was clear that it was extensive. At the height of the chaos, which lasted about three hours, as many as 1,500 people tore through Kinross, Gailey, and Weber 
Auburn Avenues, Westwood Boulevard, and Lynbrook Drive. Eyewitnesses said the crowd's mood ranged from angry to jubilant. Police ended up booking six people for burglary, failure to disperse, and throwing objects at moving vehicles with intent to injure. One man suffered severe cuts, likely from broken glass, but ran off before paramedics could treat him. Three others were treated for minor injuries and released from UCLA Medical Center. At least two youths were knocked over by a car speeding through an intersection, though they didn't appear to be badly injured. But was not confined to Los Angeles. In Las Vegas, police arrested 15 people after a fight erupted among 60 youths during a showing of New Jack City. Many of those arrested were gang members and one person was even carrying a machine gun. Another movie that sparked gang theaters across the country was Boys in the Hood. Ricky! Good evening. A Chicago man was and 20 other people were wounded in disturbances around the country last night. Disturbances linked to the opening of a movie called Boys in the Hood. Gunshots erupted just minutes before the movie started last night in Universal City, California. Five young men were wounded. In downtown Minneapolis, six people were shot. On July 14, 1991, 23-year-old writer-director John Singleton debuted his masterpiece, Boys in the Hood. This haunting story depicted the lives of young black men in the gang-ridden South Central Los Angeles and starred notable Hollywood actors like Cuba Gooding Jr., Ice Cube, Angela Bassett, Lawrence Fishburne, and Morris Chestnut. The final frame of the movie features the message, Increase the Peace, a plea directed at both the 800 gangs in LA at the time and the LAPD, who are portrayed in the film as an anti antagonistic force engaging in racial profiling and harassment in hopes of provoking arrests. Despite this call for peace, gang erupted at theaters nationwide on opening night. John Singleton spent the opening night moving around Los Angeles, discreetly slipping into the back of theaters to observe the audience, as directors often like to do. Just minutes after he left the Cineplex Odeon Theaters in Universal City near downtown LA, gunfire broke out, wounding five people. The lights went down and the screen lit up and then it just went crazy. There was gunfire. These guys were just chasing each other all over. A 19-year-old moviegoer told the LA Times. Another moviegoer told the Associated Press. People were stampeding, people were running into the bathroom. The wasn't limited to Los Angeles. Reports of shootings came in from theaters near gang territories such as Universal City, Upland, and Chino, as well as from theaters far from gang areas including San Francisco, Sacramento, Minneapolis, Riverdale, Illinois, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and New Springfield, Massachusetts. In total, there were incidents at 20 of the 900 theaters showing the movie. For instance, four people were arrested in Jersey City after a fight broke out in a shopping mall before a showing of the film. In Chicago, a 19-year-old man was stabbed by two attackers while leaving a theater. In downtown Minneapolis, a shot was fired inside a theater, possibly with the intention of causing a riot, which allowed shooters in a nearby car to open fire on pedestrians as they fled into the street. This incident resulted in four people being wounded, two of them critically. So these situations are exactly what Kirkland was talking about. And he definitely didn't want that with his own story. Now, let's dive deeper into his life. Richard Pee Wee Kirkland, born on May 6, 1945, right in the heart of Harlem, New York. Pee Wee's early life was tough. He grew up on the east side of Harlem on 116th Street with his sister and two brothers. The Kirkland family didn't have much money and one of Pee Wee's earliest memories was of shaking the cereal box in the morning to get the roaches to the bottom. But Pee Wee wasn't about to let poverty define him. From a young age, he was determined to escape the feeling of being broke. He jumped off the porch and started living fast. His first hustle was selling newspapers, but soon he linked up with some older kids who were into more serious stuff. They started stealing cars and plotting to rob jewelry stores. It's said that Pee Wee and his crew would steal jewelry and sell it to the Italian mob who would then hook them up with some serious cash. It started when I was a teenager, a young teenager. Yeah, because I was playing basketball and I was involved in life of crime. As a kid. By the time Pee Wee was 14, he had six figures in his pocket. He wasn't just any middleman in the drug game, he played it smart, never touching the drugs himself or getting involved in hand to hand transactions, which was rare back then when everyone else was getting high. Around this time, Pee Wee was also lending money to small businesses that were struggling, and remember, he was still just a teenager. Amid all this street hustle, Pee Wee started playing basketball casually. At just 14 years old, he scored 70 points in a community center game, earning a rep as a scoring machine around 
around Harlem. Standing at 6 foot 1, Pee Wee had incredible agility and was often compared to his rival at the time, Tiny Archibald. His natural talent for basketball and high IQ on the court meant he could anticipate plays before they happened. Pee Wee went on to play at Manhattan's Charles Evans Hughes High School, where he became an all-city point guard. His high school career started off slow, averaging only 16 points a game, but that all changed when an older player challenged him to step up his game. Pee Wee responded by dropping 50, sometimes even 60 points in games. Despite his growing success in organized basketball, Pee Wee still had one foot in the streets, loving the thrill of streetball and the money it brought him. During this period, basketball legend Bob McCullough, who was then the commissioner of the Rucker Park League in Harlem, recruited Pee Wee. McCullough had Pee Wee playing on a team with Willis Reed, who would later become an MVP and two-time NBA champion. Pee Wee was living it up. He was the man around Harlem, and his high school coach didn't do much to help him get a scholarship to a major college program. After high school, Pee Wee attended a community college in North Carolina where he averaged a staggering 41 points per game. From there, he transferred to Norfolk State in Virginia, teaming up with the legendary Bob Dandridge from Richmond, Virginia, who would eventually win two NBA championships with the Milwaukee Bucks. In 1968, Pee Wee and Dandridge led Norfolk State to an impressive 25-2 record. The next year, they went 21-4. With such a track record, it was clear that they were ready for the next level, the NBA. Dandridge was picked in the fourth round of the draft, while Pee Wee was chosen in the 13th round by the Chicago Bulls. But here's the twist. Pee Wee was making so much more money in the streets than he ever could in the NBA. The streets were calling and Pee Wee answered, turning down his NBA contract and heading back to Harlem where he continued to live life on his own terms. Pee Wee was offered a contract to play professionally. Uh, he declined the offer because he was making much more money selling when Pee Wee came back to Harlem, he was making more money than ever and living large. He became a hood hero, someone the community could depend on. If a family was struggling to make ends meet, Pee Wee would step in and help out. He paid for college tuition, supported community centers, and fed those who were hungry. He became known as the Bank of Harlem, not just because of his generosity, but also due to his thriving drug empire. The local hustlers used Pee Wee's money to flood the streets with product, and Pee Wee didn't have to lift a finger. His guys brought back cash at a rapid pace, and his wealth grew immensely. It's said that Pee Wee had a collection of exotic cars, Ferraris, Mercedes-Benz, Rolls Royces, along with mink furs, all kinds of jewelry, and even a mansion in Long Island. His net worth was rumored to be around $33 million, though some say it was even higher. Pee Wee was like a real-life Robin Hood, beloved by everyone in Harlem. But as with all fast lives, it wasn't meant to last forever. In 1971, the feds came down hard on Pee Wee. He was charged with conspiracy to sell narcotics and was sent to a federal penitentiary in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania for 15 years. He was released after four years, but his troubles weren't over. While he was in prison, authorities were investigating him for tax evasion. This led to another 10-year sentence. Pee Wee once said, there was the first incarceration, probably a long time coming then the second was just because of all the money from the operations of the first. All in all, Pee Wee spent about 10 years behind bars, but even in prison, he couldn't stay away from basketball. He got involved in the prison league known as Anthracite Basketball League and dominated the court. Pee Wee had games where he scored 100 points and another where he dropped an incredible 135 points. When Pee Wee finally got out of prison, he was determined to turn his life around. He started by speaking to the youth in Harlem, sharing his experiences and the lessons he'd learned. This new path led to him traveling around the country as a motivational speaker. He teamed up with Nike to launch the School of Skills program which teaches kids not just basketball skills but also life skills to steer them in the right direction. The program's goal is to create not only great basketball players but great people as well. Pee Wee's commitment to helping young kids avoid the mistakes he made helped solidify his legend in Harlem. His performances at the famous Rucker Park also played a big role in the legacy. Pee Wee is often credited with creating the crossover dribble, a move he used to perfection on the courts at Rucker Park where he won scoring titles in the Rucker Park League. Quote, I could do things that other kids couldn't do, Pee Wee once said. I was the only player to lead in scoring at Rucker for two consecutive years. In 1997, Pee Wee took on a new role as the head basketball coach at Dwight School, a college prep school in New York City. Here, he continued to share his message about learning the game of basketball and staying on the right path. Pee Wee led the school to multiple championships in his short time there. Even now, Pee Wee continues to inspire the youth of Harlem and beyond with his story. Pee Wee Kirkland's legacy as a streetball legend will forever be remembered. He wasn't just a great athlete. He was a community leader who used his influence to advocate for social change.